the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth. And show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that is used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Once again, brothers and sisters, and Jennifer, could I ask you to introduce your daughter, whose oh, full name is is just blanking in my brain? Sure, this is Nola June Lolo. I knew the June part. <laughs> Nola, I kept thinking Noel, and I knew that wasn't right. Welcome, Nola. <laughs> Welcome to you. She's the new, the newest newborn at Grace Church, and it's wonderful to have you back at worship. After this this time, I, I call Jennifer and all mothers heroes of life, especially in the last month when you're going through that. <laughs> that bearing of life into the world. So bless you and, and welcome little Nola. Well, as I said this week in our mail, we got as members of Grace Church our pledge card and our letter encouraging us to prayerfully consider what gift we can make to the church next year. This weekend in our worship, we listened to a story in which Jesus discusses a matter which may at first seem similar, the matter of paying taxes to the emperor. I think that become clear as we go along tonight, I don't really think these are two very similar things at all, but I think just the fact that money is mentioned in the gospel in some way um, allows us to think, well, maybe there's a connection. But the Pharisees, it says in the Bible, are trying to trap Jesus, as they've been doing. We've been reading right through this chapter 22. We haven't missed a verse out of chapter 22 over the last three weeks. And this confrontation continues in the temple between Jesus and the leaders of his religious faith and culture. And the controversy they hope uh, to provoke with Jesus will allow them to arrest him for some reason. And we, we don't know why they picked this question. Perhaps they picked the issue of the Roman tax, tax because it's a controversial matter that people disagree about. Perhaps they pick it because they think Jesus may criticize the emperor who demands the tax. And then they could tell on him and get the Roman soldiers to arrest Jesus and get him out of the way. But Jesus famously stumps them with his answer, pointing out that the coins used for the tax have the emperor's image stamped on them and the emperor's slogan. Therefore, he says, give to the emperor the things that belong to the emperor and to God the things that are God's. It is not at all clear, either at the time or as a teaching for all time, what Jesus means with this saying. Those who remember the occasion and wrote it down don't elaborate at all. They report only that his answer once again got his antagonists, at least for a while, off his back. They were amazed and they left him and went away, the Bible says. In our time, we use money with our president's picture on it. We don't live in an empire, but in a democracy. We use money for the sake of convenience so that our busy lives aren't bogged down by having to negotiate every time we need something or every time someone else needs something from us. Imagine the, uh, the, di the different kind of life we would be leading without currency, dragging around our chickens to trade for you know, a new pair of underwear or whatever. <laughs> How would you get through a school day, girls, if you had to barter and trade for your pencils and pens and papers? Maybe school is one place where you actually can still do that, right? I'll trade, do you ever trade your Twinkie for somebody's apple at lunch? We always used to trade at lunch. It was a fun place to trade. But imagine if we had to do that all the time. Of course, life would be crazy. 
And just to be clear, nobody thinks Jesus was teaching that in his time or ours, we shouldn't use money as a means of exchange, as a means of making life, uh, which is often quite complicated, go much more smoothly for everyone and fairly. But in giving this vague answer to a controversial question of his time, Jesus doesn't give us all that much guidance, really, about what to do with our money in our time. What he does do, I'm thankful that he does do this, he gives me the opportunity to point out a difference. A difference between any question about what we should do and the matter of what we want to do, what our hearts are moved to do. Whenever we ask, what should I do? We are generally seeking to order our lives by some value. Right? We would only ask that question and invite someone into a conversation about that if we, if we thought, well, maybe I can get to some kind of common agreement that will help me order my life. You know, we don't expect people to say, if we ask, what should I do? Well, go jump off the bridge. <laughs> we, we say, what should I do? It's a difficult question. I'm trying to decide. What values, what guidance is most important in this matter? The more complicated life becomes, the more complicated it becomes to guide our lives consistently by our values. One value that we may think is very important may become very, very difficult uh, to hold in a, in a different situation. A value that we may hold and that may work very well in family life, let's all take care of each other, may not work very well let's say, in national life. Let's have a single-payer health care system or, or something like that in which we try to say we're going to all do it the same way. So we, we find ourselves, well, what value should I use? How should I think about this matter, right? So to come to the matter of our church budget and our pledges, it might make some sense to ask this kind of question. What should I give to my church or to the church or in some, uh, some way, what should I give to God and God's work? Just like the Pharisees might wonder, should we pay a tax to the emperor or not? How do you answer a question like that? Jesus might have said, well, since the emperor is going to put you in jail to rot unless you pay the tax, it would be really stupid not to pay it. Why are you asking me this question? That would make sense, wouldn't it? Or he could have said, I think it's time to protest the tax that the emperor requires of us. Let's throw a tea party. <laughs> Let's protest the tax. Every Jewish person who wants to be faithful should protest with me. Jesus could have said that. That would beg the next question. Okay, Jesus, we're with you. How do we protest? Should we just not pay? Or should we pay but write a big letter and all sign a protest, a petition? Should we get ready to fight when the soldiers arrest us? Should we fight to the death? Or only to the pain? I love that expression. Let's fight to the death. No, just to the pain. What I'm trying to get at, you see, is, as plainly as I can, is that when you ask a question in this way, what should I do? The matter opens into an increasingly complicated affair. We could try the same thing with our congregational budget. How should we, as a congregation faithful to Jesus in ministry together, fund our common mission? Churches have had, you know, very different, different answers to that question over the years. There is not one single way the church has set up the practice of funding what it does in Jesus' name. Some churches haven't had anything to fund. There is no budget. Just a group of people who come together to pray to care for one another, to bear witness in the world to Jesus' love with their lives and, and with their words and deeds, and they invite others to join them. It doesn't take a budget to do that. Why would there need to be a budget? Well, it's hard to sing without an organ. All right, let's get together and pay for an organ. And there we go, right, Carl? The budget starts to get bigger. And eh, we got to find somebody to play it every week. And, uh, you know, Carl's getting older and older, and he doesn't show up anymore as a volunteer, so we better pay somebody... Uh, a student who really, you know, can be dependable because we're paying them. Then we have a budget, right? Well, we don't like meeting out in the rain. It's just, it's annoying when it rains. It's beautiful in the sun, but we better throw up a roof. And we need a budget. 
Churches have sometimes said, let the rich people pay for it. They can be in charge of it too then if they want to. Do you know that in church history it was quite common in, in across, the, across the land, across the church, for people to pay a large sum of money and then they would get to be the bishop. Now who on earth would want to do that? From what I know about being the bishop, um, I, I can't imagine. But in those days, being the bishop meant something different than it means now, at least in some ways. And it was a prestigious thing to do. And if you had a lot of money, you didn't have to go to seminary. You could just get yourself appointed bishop if you made a big enough donation to the church. Sometimes, like here in Lancaster, many Lutheran churches used to charge a flat fee to be a member. They called it pew rent. If you go down to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church or St. James Episcopal Church, you can even see evidence of that old thing. Sometimes the names are still written on the pews, and they had little doors, and you didn't dare go in if you hadn't paid your pew rent in that pew. That was for the people that had paid for the ministry of the church by buying a pew or renting a pew for the year. How should we fund our church? Maybe we should have pew rent. Churches have thought so for long periods of time. Sometimes churches had dues. I think here at Grace Church, we were part of a, an era in which people paid dues. We sort of said, here's what the uh, average dues should be. If everybody paid the same thing, we have 500 members, budget's going to be $500, then everybody would pay dues of $1, right? And so on. That's fair in another way. Some pastors have insisted over the years that any member of their church must present their income tax form to prove that they are following the Old Testament principle of tithing, paying a certain percentage, usually thought to be 10% of their income to the church. That was one way that the Jewish temple funded its ministries, asking people for a tithe, a gift of 10%, or not always 10%, a proportionate gift. If you had 10 baby lambs, you know, give one up. It would be sacrificed in the temple, and then the poor could eat the meat. But this kind of way of funding the church or the mission of the church also raises many should-type questions. Should I tithe before taxes or after taxes? After, somebody said. <laughs> right, that makes for a smaller gift, right? Okay, well, should my tithe include other gifts to charities other than the church, or, or is it just the church that I have to tithe, and then everything else is... Uh, up to me. Should the church use other means to raise money, like spaghetti dinners, if people don't tithe enough? Should we open a restaurant in Fellowship Hall? That raises other questions. Well, should we pay the tax that the government will require us to pay if we start selling spaghetti? Will we be subject to the health department regulations? Should we go to all that trouble? Should we, should we, should we? On and on. I could try to answer this question. But others might want to argue that my answer is wrong or didn't take account of this or that and so forth. But I have taken vows. And my vows are to teach you the Holy Scriptures, to help you to live by them, to help us together to reflect God's word, God's calling, and God's presence in our lives. So I think it is important to think about these things, not just in the negative, what shouldn't we do, but to try to, to give at least a context in which we can decide how we're going to act. I think it is important to point out that when the Bible discusses giving, it only rarely speaks in the language of the law. You should do this. I mean, sometimes it does. There are laws about giving. There are laws about tithing. There are laws about what you should do um, when you have sheep born in your flock and when you have a great big harvest in your field. Paul's teaching is very simple. If you're looking for a simple answer, he says, give in proportion to what you've received. If you've received a lot, you can give a lot. If you don't have much to work with, you can give a little. You know, the consistent expectation of the Bible is that people who belong to God will often take things that are precious or valuable. In our case, usually our money stands in for those things and simply give them up as an act of worship. Sometimes the reason that's given for that is kind of a psychological or a spiritual one. Where your treasure is, Jesus said it, there your heart will be also. 
And so if we give in certain directions, we presume that by acting in that way, our heart will follow, our spirit will follow. In any case, that kind of giving doesn't arise from somebody saying, you should do this, but as a response to grace, maybe out of thanksgiving. For others, maybe there isn't any clear motivation. Sometimes God takes hold of us in ways that we cannot even explain. We're becoming new creations, as Paul says, bearing the fruit that God produces in us, as the Bible says, and Jesus' parables have been teaching us, right? Let us bear fruit. The church in mission expects this to happen in people. The church expects God's people to be moved to give. There is no should about it. If we are faithful people, we know that God is with us, and we know that God is moving the hearts of his people in all kinds of ways, out of thanksgiving, out of joy, out of concern for their neighbor, out of interest in some particular aspect of things. I couldn't possibly hope to catalog all the reasons that people are moved to give and to be generous. We simply expect it to happen, and in fact, I'm going to proclaim it to you tonight as the reality of God's presence in our midst. It will happen. I am not worried about how we're going to fund our ministry next year. We have funded it for many years in the past, and I'm confident that God will work in this congregation to produce generous gifts for our ministry. Christ is living in you. You are becoming better people in some ways, different people in some ways. You are growing in many ways. One of the fruits the Holy Spirit produces, the Bible promises, is the fruit of generosity. Not because I've told you this is what you should do, but because of what God is doing to you as you come here each week and hear the gospel and receive the supper and the gifts of God. This is what we expect to happen in church. And so, if we approach our funding, our ministry at Grace and how we fund it, in a way that is faithful and biblical, I cannot possibly limit you or instruct you in one single way that seeks to shape what you should do. Our leaders at Grace have prayerfully recommended a budget to the council, which, will be, uh, which has been now recommended to the congregation, and you'll receive that in uh, in other ways, you've received it in one way in this mailing, a kind of summary form. You'll receive the line-by-line line budget in the mailing before the congregational meeting. We believe that that budget is faithful to what God is calling us to do, to live out our life in Christ together here, to worship together, and to serve together. We believe that it's a faithful and challenging budget that responds to the opportunities God gives us in this place to love our neighbors near and far with the love of Christ. At Grace, we do that in some special and unique ways. We are Christians in the Lutheran tradition, so we worship in a certain kind of way. We enjoy certain kinds of music. We have a certain kind of building. We have customs that we're used to here just because this is our local way of doing things. And in ways that connect us with God's people of every age. We sing. We pray. We baptize. We share the Lord's Supper. We wear funny robes when we lead worship and so forth and so on. Lots of things that we do here have meaning that connect us with God's people of many times and many places. What you can do is to let God lead you to respond as you are able. I think anything else I could say would simply be a gimmick. I can't gimmick you into making a gift to Grace Church for any other reason than that your thankful heart for God's love in Jesus Christ is moving you to give it. I want to close with a little story about life in the church in a certain time long, long ago when the church was coming into um, the lands of France and Germany, the, the part of Europe that was, uh, was held uh, in the control of a tribe called the Gauls. You know Caesar's Gallic Wars? That was the war against the Gauls. And the Gauls were a warlike tribe. They spoke uh, language kind of like French or Celtic uh, the language of France and then moving into Belgium and then over to England. They were the, the Celtic people and they had um, a kind of bloody, gory, natural religion, a pagan religion that involved lots of sacrifices and blood and you can read all about it if you go on the internet or get out your old en uh, encyclopedia and look up the Druids. Okay, That's who these people were. 
By the time of the Christian era, they had been conquered by the Roman Empire. They were supposedly under the control of the empire and the church. The Gauls never did, though, take too well to being conquered by the Romans. There were numerous Gallic uprisings. That's why Caesar got to write that big book about it. But a number of missionaries ventured into Gallic territory, and over time, many of the Gauls did convert to Christianity and were baptized. And as the story goes, when a converted warrior was baptized in a river or a stream, often they would hold their dominant arm, whether they were right-handed or left-handed, up in the air as they were being baptized. This seemed like a peculiar custom, and the missionaries tried to find out why they were doing it, and they found out the Gauls were taking baptism very seriously, just as seriously as they took their own pride in their ability to be strong warriors. When the next battle or the next skirmish broke out, the warriors could exclaim, this arm was not baptized, and they could go off into war and destroy their enemy in a most unchristian manner. The missionaries comment on this, and it was noted in some of the, the little uh, diaries and, and fragments of history we have from that time. The story may not be uh, a story about a large, uh, you know, a widespread custom in the land, but it was noted as a peculiar example, and it strikes me as a very powerful one for what I'm trying to <clears throat> preach about with you here tonight. Certainly not to... Uh, Beat down the Gauls if you have Gallic ancestors or anything like that. That's not the point at all. But think of the image. The image is so powerful. The picture of someone, anyone, trying to keep one part of their body, one part of their life, one part of their identity free from the influence of the Holy Spirit. Free from the influence of the gifts of grace. If the message that gathers us together means anything, if Jesus' love comes to us, as St. Paul says tonight, not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and in full conviction, then we cannot consciously and purposefully keep anything free from the influence of the baptismal grace we have all been given. So if you find yourself making any decision, any financial decision, any decision that answers the question, what should I do? First stop, take a moment to gather yourself, to open yourself to prayer and ask, is this decision part of my life in Christ? Or is it something else? I trust that if we can all ask that question, if we can take time to ask that question, to pause and reflect in that way, then God will lead us to do what is needful for his mission in this place, in the coming year and all the years to come. Amen.